Good morning, namaste. Um, I just wanted to say yesterday I went and I looked for a number of the texts that people had said they wanted to uh, have some clarification on the Pantanjali and, and the Shiva Sutras, etc. Unfortunately, I was not able to find any of those texts here. Uh, I'm going to look at a couple more stores today, but I'm in Florida. Okay. <laughs> Florida is very, uh, really not progressive when it comes to uh, finding, uh, especially Hindu texts, very difficult to find here. So I may have to um, have you, uh, if you want a text spoken about, if you have the text, if you could send it to me and then I'll return it to you uh, when I'm done speaking on it. Um, that might work uh, because uh, anyway, uh, people are sending quite a few different texts in and if I have to go out and uh, look for all those <laughs> books on the net and, and buy a bunch of books, I'll have a whole big library here, which I really don't need to have. But what I did find, I went out in my garage because all the books are packed in the garage at the moment. Um, but I did find one, it, it popped up, and I had never really gone through it. I bought this a long time ago when I lived in India and I went to the Sri Ramana ashram and it's the Sri Ramana Gita so I did find that so um, this morning I thought what I might do is go through some of it and uh, what this uh, apparently is is they had somebody there and they were asking questions of Ramana and then uh, towards the uh, back of it it will give the answers that he gave. So um, I thought I would do um, a bit of these and uh, I'll give my answer and then um, I can go into the back and see what his answer was that he had given. Now our answers should match up pretty closely um, unless there's some difference in a cultural context etc but I don't think there should be too much variance uh, in the answers given. So let's go forward. The first is on the importance of upasana, or being seated near, being seated near the, the guru or near. So um, let's see what they have to say on this. It starts out, with I bow to Maharishi Ramana Kartikeya in human form and set forth his teaching in this lucid work. In the year 1913 of the Christian era, on the 29th of cold December, when all of the disciples were seated around with attentive minds, I asked Bhagavan Maharishi for definite answers to certain questions. The first question is, is mukti or liberation, the release from the phenomenal existence, aka liberation, <laughs> is mukti to be had by mere discrimination between the real and the unreal, or are there other means for ending of bondage? No, mukti and liberation is not gained by simply uh, uh, discrimination between the real and unreal. One can have glimpses, you know, along the way, flashes of insights, but insights are not mukti. Mukti and liberation is only gained when one is resting in that absolute, the power of Brahman, once ego has been blown out, uh, and, and that's what remains is Parabrahman, okay, or that consciousness that goes through that change. So mere discrimination between, you know, what is uh, uh, discrimination between real and unreal 
is not enough to bring liberation. Okay, let's see what Ramana's answer was to that. Okay, answer to the first question. Okay, abidance in the self alone releases one from all bonds. Exactly, one has to be uh, in that Pada Brahman, in that uh, changed state of consciousness. Okay. Discrimination between real and the unreal leads to non-attachment. Okay. Absolutely. One can have insights, one can have uh, flashes, but uh, when that just helps you to not be attached, that you will go forward more in your journey to finally rest and uh, break through all the bonds to rest in Padabraman or uh, that liberation, jnana, that, that absolute uh, knowledge that remains as is. Okay, let's see, as he goes on and says, um, the jnani, or the liberated being, jnani, one with great knowledge, okay, is unfathomable. He abides always in self alone. He does not consider the universe as unreal or as different from himself. Right, everything, because everything proceeds from this Parabrahman. Everything that's in the seen world, the Shakti, like I said, it's like a shade. You know, the, the seen world is like a shade with many holes in it. But if the ultimate source is Parabrahman, or that self, what one terms the big S self. It's not a bigger ego self, like many gurus want to try to uh, expound and say that it's something you gather and collect. It's not that. It's absolutely the other direction, that when everything falls away and one gets uh, blown out, they say it's blown out, uh, all these identifications end, and what remains is that Pada Brahman. Okay. So let's go forward to um, the second question. Is a study of scriptures enough by itself to liberate those desirous of knowledge or is spiritual practice according to the master's injunctions also necessary? Well, of course, that it, you know, there are some that teach if you study the scriptures, you'll gain all this vast knowledge and that it's enough for uh, liberation. But it's not. All you have are more facts and figures and things you can roll off and spout. But if you don't have the direct living experience of it, of the falling away, then all you've done is gathered and collected more facts, more things you can speak about. But one has to absolutely break through, and, and it's not gotten there by studying. It's not like a college degree where you're learning a subject, something that's subjective, something that's in the seen world. This is not that. This is prior to the seen world, prior to all that that comes into existence. And you can't learn about that. You have to actually um, go through the whole of the journey and uh, to find yourself uh, imploded into that again, Pada Brahman. Let's see what um, Ramana's answer is to this question. Um, he says, the seeker of knowledge does not achieve his end merely by the study of scriptures. Without Upasana, there cannot be attainment for him. This is definite. Okay, yes, no, you have to be right with that source, you have to be right there. Um, goes on to say, experiencing the natural state during spiritual practice is called upasana. And when that state becomes firm and permanent, that in itself is jnana. When discarding sense objects, and one discards sense objects when one realizes it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, it's not that. Okay. 
it's a process of elimination, but not elimination just as when one is speaking. It's a process of elimination that just, you know, it takes place the further one goes, the more one releases and sees that it's none of these things, okay? So let's see what it goes on to say. One abides in one's own true nature as a flame of gyan. This state of being is termed sahaj stiti. Sahaj is effortless. So yes, one enters into realization, one implodes into realization, the mind stills, and then one, all as one is cognizant of, is that divine is. It's ever present. It's not something that comes and goes any longer. It's not something that one gets maybe a small taste of. Even with uh, Gyan, you know, when you when you when everything falls away, it takes a good another year or two years before one is finally fully uh, uh, immersed in and becomes a Gyani or full of that knowledge that's uh, ever present, okay? Uh, when one first falls away, you may have some blips of things that come back and forth into view for a short time, but never does it occlude that truth, ever present truth that one has now become, okay? So let's go back and see if I can find where, okay, question. Third question is, how does a sthita prajna recognize himself as such? Is it by knowing the fullness of his enlightenment, or is it by cessation of objective awareness? Okay. Well, I can say that one knows themselves. It's not that one stops seeing an objective world. It's only in the moment when everything falls away that world does not exist to you. You do not see uh, yourself. You do not see this world. You do not see anything. You are just absolutely that seed state of is Pada Brahman. Uh, that, that's what it's there. Then one comes back and is cognizant of the world again, uh, and the world comes back into view, okay, at that point, it's not that you no longer see objects, of course you see them, but you are no longer, uh, as they would say, be fooled by their appearance, so, you know, you know that at the core of all of that is simply this uh, essence of is, Pada Brahman. Okay, one knows uh, liberation uh, within themselves because they know the essence of being is simply that self. None of the other occluding drama remains to, uh, to, um, to close off that uh, wisdom and seeing. So let's see what... Um, Ramana has to say, here it is, answer to the fourth question. Uh, from the mark of equality towards all beings, one's attainment of gyan is, is inferred. Okay, so basically what he is saying is like I was saying, uh, you know, that one, uh, when realization is entered, that one cannot hate anyone any longer. It doesn't matter, you know, I can be... Uh, you can get angry with something in the moment, but it's a momentary blip, uh, but one cannot hate anyone. That, that absolutely is, is gone. So that equanimity towards all is, is there. Uh, it doesn't matter, like I said, I see some of the fake and fraud gurus, and it can make you very angry for a time and very uh, sad but you know that they are also being deluded and they are going to pay a heavy karmic price for what they're doing. And this 
makes one sad when it, you know still has that equanimity and and can never uh, hate uh, that is gone just goes just goes okay next question does samadhi lead only to gyan or does it also confer the material fruit desired well <laughs> if one is on a genuine path they're not looking for these material goods they're looking to to uncover to discover uncover that which is the reality of the universe what is primal so it has nothing to do with gathering and collecting anything it has to do with taking one to that ultimate wisdom or gyan uh, so let's see what he has to say about this answer to fifth question. when the practice of samadhi is begun with a desire okay so we have a little difference in what we're saying with this. When a practice of samadhi is begun with a desire, the desire will also surely bear fruit. Okay. So, yeah, if, if you are having a desire for some material things, and if you want to manifest something in a material world, one does it by, uh, you know, going into basically meditation and knowing what it is your heart's desire is. And then when one releases that, it will come back to one in it, the form of the material good, whatever it is one was seeking for. Okay. But I think many people that are really genuinely seeking realization are not pursuing the material world, the material goods, okay? So I'll leave it at that. Uh, sixth question. If one practicing yoga for a desired end becomes a stiti prajna, is that desire also fulfilled or not? Hearing these questions of mine, Bhagavan Ramana Rishi, to dispel my doubts in the plenitude of his grace, spoke thus. Okay, then it goes on to answer the questions. Okay, so if one is practicing yoga for a desired end, okay, I would say it depends on what the desired end is. When you, when everything falls away, your things that you're chasing after would would uh, the, the importance of that would change okay um, but I don't see why it's not conceivable that that um, that that would not be attained okay all right, let's see what he says. In practicing yoga with a desire, if one becomes a stiti prajna, uh, one is not elated through the desire, though the desire is still fulfilled. Okay, so you're not attached to the outcome of it. If it comes, it comes, but there's no longer that uh, attachment to it. So one is not, um, you know, uh, one is not uh, driven by those desires and uh, it's okay it comes uh, that's nice uh, but the main thing that one um, gains but you can't say gains because it's not something that one gathers and collects uh, one remains within that wisdom and that's paramount okay um, the things of the world can come and go. They all can come and go, and they all will come and go. Everything in the manifest world will come and go. But this is unchanging. This does not come and go. This remains always, eternally, forever the same. Okay. 
and that's why one stays in this equilibrium okay because one abides in that unchanging truth that unchanging is the para brahman one remains within that and is that and then uh, again that's that's the mind stills quiets no more revolving thoughts okay one is just in that quietude that peace that passes understanding that is okay <laughs> and then from that point you know uh, we live a very different cognition than was there um, when we started the journey so I'll just say that namaste I hope you've enjoyed this uh, and uh, we'll go on to another chapter if, if you did enjoy this let me know and we'll do another chapter if not I'll look for a different type of a text and we can go through that as well I did find the Tao Te Ching I did find a copy of that and uh, what was it Dhammapada I think I found it Dhamma, Dhammapada I think I found a copy of that uh, so I did find a few things um, that we could go through um, if you want something from the Bible do you have a specific chapter or do you have a specific subject the Bible is a very large <laughs> undertaking as well we have Old Testament we have New Testament um, so I need to have a little bit more defined as to what it is you would like to hear about okay I thank you for that. Namaste. Have a great day. Bye, guys.